I want to tell you guys a quick quote that I learned of last night. I've already told you this. The only person who limits you stares back at you in the mirror every single day. So today we have Gary Plague. I said that correct? That's uh, good enough. On how to uh, find more courage. Gary, take it away. Great. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Still some stragglers coming in. Hi. Zach, thanks for the opportunity to speak here at Hatch. I've been hanging out here a little bit, and I always get inspired when I come here and, and get to see people who are also in the entrepreneurial travel and journey. As the student commencement speaker, uh, per perhaps my admission that I am far from the best orator comes to you as a surprise. As a person who stutters, I could be no more certain that in this room and in this hall are thousands of people who are far more talented at public speaking than I am. <clears throat> at the same time, however, I could be no more certain that the message I have to share is one that must be heard. Far too often, society has instilled and reinforced the idea that those of us with disabilities are to remain disabled and perhaps even incapable. Whether one is bound to a wheelchair or suffers from ADHD or repeats the first syllable of a word, as I sometimes do, we have been tacitly yet resoundingly told to doubt both ourselves and our abilities. Doubt, as has been observed, kills more dreams and failure ever will. Yet if doubt were to be a disease, its cure would be confidence. So truer words never been spoken. And I think in the space that we're in, that oftentimes we have doubt. We're trying to start a business, trying to get our name out there, and we have doubt about what we should do, and people tell us it's not going to work. Have we all heard that? You're crazy for doing that. It's not going to work. Why don't you get a regular job like everybody else? And a lot of times it's because we, we're not confident. And if we are confident, we have the opportunity to make a difference and be successful. So <clears throat> this statement, I live by this. It really helps me to continue to be inspired. So today, we're going to talk about finding the courage to tell your story. And then we're going to talk about some tools that make your story stick. You ready? Yes. So a few things we're going to talk about. First, executive presence. We'll have an idea of what that is. We'll go into a little bit of detail on each of these topics. Number two, performance anxiety, which a lot of people suffer from. It's, it's a, a scary thing. And if you go exploring it, I believe it's important for you to understand what it is. When you understand what it is, it's a lot easier to deal with. Then we'll take a look at some engagement tips. We'll talk about starting with the bang, what you can do to really get people's attention when you begin the presentation, and some visual aid clues, things that you can do to be highly effective with the tools that you use to enhance your story. And then we'll talk about effective Q&A sessions and how those work. Good? Yeah. So what is executive presence? Anybody have any idea? How people perceive you. How people perceive you. I've often heard of it as it. The person has it or the person doesn't have it. So what is that it factor? You all know people that have it. You see them, you talk to them, you experience them, and they feel, you feel really good about them, and they seem to be really, really competent. So the first thing that's, on, there's a three pillars here of executive presence, and the first one is gravitas. Gravitas is your confidence, your strength under fire, what happens when people ask you questions about your business or your plan? Do you get rattled? My goal is always to ask people hard questions. How can I get you to not be able to answer the question very well? 
That's the moment of truth. So we want to look for people that, the executive presence piece is people that have gravitas. They have strength under fire and they have confidence. The second one is communication. Presentation quality, what their, what their language is like, their body language, their tone of voice, and their, resol their, their the way they deal with other people. So their communication skills, interpersonal communication skills, those things are the second piece. And the third piece is their appearance. How do they look? Are they dressed appropriately? Do they carry themselves confidently? So executive presence is a really, really important thing when you're going and looking for funding. Who wants to fund you if you don't look like you know what you're doing? If you haven't thought about some of those things. We often don't have a good idea of who we are. We're not really aware of what other people see very often. You may have seen this before. <clears throat> Four levels of competence. Have you seen this before? No. Unconscious incompetence. People do not know that they don't know how to do something. If you know how, if you know about something but you don't know how to do it, that would be conscious incompetence. You are aware that you're incompetent at something. And then the third level is conscious competence. You are aware that you know how to do this, but perhaps not at the level that you want to do it. And finally is unconscious competence, which is where we see people that are really awesome. They're, they're great athletes. Uh, ice skaters, for example, they, they slide around on, on two blades and jump in the air and turn four times and land and don't fall down. And they're really not aware of how good they are. Or artists or musicians who are really, really great but they're not aware of how great they really are. There's an interesting study done by two guys at a university. <clears throat> it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, what they came up with. And that is that the people who have weak skills tend to rate themselves very highly on the tests they take, but their test scores don't turn out very well. But they rate themselves very highly. And the people who have really awesome skills tend to rate themselves a little bit lower than their skills would demonstrate and than their test scores. So where do we see this most often? We see it on television, where the people who are really good don't realize how good they are, and the people who are terrible think they're awesome. We see it on American Idol, where somebody goes up and sings, and then the judges don't pass them through, and then they get in an argument with the judges about how great they really are, or they go out in the hallway and talk to the camera about how disappointed they are because they're really great, because everybody told them they were great, but in fact, we heard them not sing very well. So they evaluate themselves very highly, but their skills don't support that, and their performance doesn't support that. You want to be sure that that doesn't happen to you. So many of the things we're going to talk about today have to do exactly with that. If you're not aware of what you do when you're in this situation, if you've not seen that, if you've not experienced it, if you've not critically looked at it, then you may be setting yourself up to be a victim of Dunning-Kruger effect, where your story is great, your product's great, your skill is great, but the skill at presenting that is not great. I always like people who say, well, I've been this successful in my career doing this, why would I need to go work on those communication skills? Well, you might have been better. You might have been even more successful if you'd worked on those things. So that's what we're going to do today. Something that I never, we always talk about presentations. I don't think of them as presentations. I think of them as performances. Every one of them is a performance, not a presentation. I also get people who say, I say, are you ready for your presentation? And they say, yep, I got it all right here in the box. I got my PowerPoint slides all done, I'm ready to go. Well, that's not the presentation. That's not the performance. You are the performance. What would happen if, if, you're, if a, you had the opportunity to go to Berlin to present and pitch your idea, and you got there and the power was out, and your laptop got broken on the way, and you just had an in-person, no lights, no technology, can I tell everybody about my product? Can you do that? If that's the case, then it's not about what's in the box. It's all about your performance skills. 
Some things about people who are really good performers <clears throat> is that they're self-aware, they're self-confident, they're skilled, they know their stuff, they know how to do things, they're knowledgeable, and they're vulnerable, and they're creative. Why would vulnerability be a really important thing for people who are really good performers? Why do you think? Risk taking, exactly. Because is it going to be perfect the first time out? Probably not. I don't know too many people who learned how to do a really important, really not important, but impressive skill to play basketball or ice skate or play a musical instrument or sing or do whatever. I don't know too many who have ever done that by reading the book. Generally, we have to go try it a bunch of times. Trying it live in front of a live audience is not a good idea. Not a good idea. What happens when you do that? Usually you fail. And then you never want to do it again. And you never want to do it again because that experience was so horrible. So you don't do it any anymore. You just say, that's not for me. I'm not. And you conclude that you're not a good performer when that may not be the case at all. You may be a great performer. You're just not aware of how great you are or the areas you need to work on things. We start having that kind of self-doubt, <clears throat> it leads to performance anxiety. And I think of this little bird, and there he is sitting in a tree, and he says, sometimes I feel really nervous and scared in front of all those people. Why do we feel nervous and afraid in front of all those people? Because we're being judged. Because we think we're being judged, and in fact we are. We're being evaluated. There's another piece in play there. I taught at George Mason for about eight years. And when I first started there as an adjunct, I never understood why the students were afraid. It was a public speaking class. I didn't understand why they were afraid. Then I realized the perspective was wrong. Because they had been used to sitting in the back of a classroom for their whole lives, looking at the front of one face standing up. And now I put them in front of the classroom, looking at the fronts of a bunch of faces that are sitting down. That's not a perspective that we're used to seeing. And so once we had gone through the whole semester and they'd been up in front of the class about 10 or 15 times, were they nearly as nervous? No. This is, they got used to the space. They got used to being here. Got used to doing that. Let's talk a bit about performance anxiety. <clears throat> this will demystify it for you. Will it correct it and fix it for you? Probably not. But it will help you to understand what causes it and why it's, why it's living there. Does anybody have performance anxiety? Be honest. Some people do. Good. Most of the room. If you're human, it's likely. Highly likely. So it's normal. It's often in advance of the event. You get the assignment. You get the opportunity. You start getting really, really nervous about it. So that can happen. It's automatic and unconscious. You feel it happening and you can't stop it. And the more you try to stop it, the more nervous and anxious you get. And then you quickly can run off the cliff and conclude, I never want to do this again because it's too scary for me. I just don't want to do it. It's participatory. That means that if you don't play, it can't happen. You have to agree to play or it can't work. It has no power over you if you don't play. It's learned behavior. <clears throat> Look at little kids. Look at kids who are five, seven, three. Do they have any fear? Generally not. They're generally not afraid. They'll do whatever. They'll perform. They'll get up in front of people and make them laugh. Then they start learning that that's not behavior we should do. We shouldn't do that because people will make fun of us. So we stop doing it. We stop putting ourselves out there and we, we get start having performance anxiety, the older we get, the more and more afraid we are in general. Watch Dr. Phil one time and he had the woman on there who was a great concert pianist, but she wouldn't play for anybody. And he said, what are you nervous about? And she said, well, I'm, he says, you're probably afraid I'm going to ask you to play. And she said, yeah, I'd be terrified if you made me play the piano right now. And so he said, bring out the piano. So he brought this big piano out and asked her to play and she played in front of all these people. And her, her husband or her boyfriend stood right behind her. And she played beautifully. And she didn't make any mistakes. 
But that was the first step in her moving past that. But it's so bad for some people uh, that, that they just are crippled by it. And then we also have performance anxiety that happens during the event. You're fine leading up to it, and then you get really nervous at the event. And then there's also post-event anxiety where people get really freaked out after they've done it. Because then all the things start filling their minds about what did people think about me. <clears throat> Finally, it's the fear of being evaluated or judged that you talked about earlier. So there's three parts of performance anxiety. Cognitive structures are the first piece, and that is the beliefs we have about ourselves and what people say about us, what we think they think about us. <clears throat> yeah, number two is self-talk, which is often negative, and then physical and psychological responses that happen to us. We get sweaty, our voices shake, we start shaking. We think everybody can see that, and they really can't, but they think we, we think they can, and that gets, makes, just makes us more and more nervous. So going on to cognitive structures, their beliefs we have about ourselves, our abilities, our skills, and they're often set when we're young. When we're little kids, we're in that eight to 10 range, those start, things start to happen. We hear what people say, often it's supported by parents and adults. They'll say things about us and we hear it. We start questioning ourselves. We go, oh, well they must be right, because they're adults and they're parents and they tell us that. Guess what? They're really difficult to change. Difficult to change because they've been formed when we're really little and we believe them and we keep finding ways <clears throat> to support that they must be true. We look for confirmation of those beliefs. Yeah, see, I'm not very good at this because I just failed at it again. Or I'm really awesome at that because I just won these five things. But I believe that the people who believe the positive sides of that are far fewer than the people who, who live in the negative world of what I can't do. Next one is negative self-talk. The more negative self-talk equals more anxiety. The more you tell yourself it's gonna, not, it's gonna fail, I'm not gonna be very good at it, the more and more anxiety you have about it. <clears throat> These are my favorite. It's catastrophizing and awfulizing. If I mess up on this, then I won't ever get any more work. Nobody will hire me. I'll have to live in a box out on the street somewhere. I, I'm a failure. I'll have to move from the town I live in. I can never show my face again. Really? Anybody ever played that game? It just gets worse and worse and worse. <clears throat> Sometimes we have perfectionist schemas. Anybody here identify as a perfectionist, willing to share that? At least one, a couple? Yeah. I bet some of you are closet perfectionists. Just haven't realized it yet. I was one, and then I'm heel ed now, but I'm better at least. But I, <clears throat> when I taught at Mason, I would go to these classes for, for my students at the counseling center to see, just to check them out, to see if I could offer a student to go there, I could say, hey, you should go to check out the counseling center. And this one class was on managing perfectionism. It was an evening class. And I went, and the teacher came in, and, or the instructor came in, and wrote on the board, perfectionism with a K, and then walked out of the room. This was 15 minutes before we started. And then when she finally came back, she said, how many people's heads are spinning because of this K right here? And everybody was like that. And I started realizing, wow, you know, maybe I have some of this. Maybe I should look at this and think about reassessing that. Because it doesn't have to be perfect. And maybe what you think is perfect, maybe your 90% is better than most people's 100%. Maybe your 70% is better than most people's 100%. That just might be the case. And so you could let go of some of that stuff. There's also. Um, we'll talk about this in a second. There's also two kinds of perfectionists, and we'll, we'll cover that in a minute. Uh, and finally, what will others think about me? It's kind of a self-imposed self, self, self -imposed perfectionism. 
inwardly focused versus outwardly focused. I was an outwardly focused perfectionist doing all these things because if I did them, then every, if I did them for other people, they'd be done correctly. Well, guess what? When you do that, you get all the work. You get none of, there's no, re, there's no release for you. You're always doing 100 things because you can do them right. When really, letting somebody else do it might be better. Okay, then we have psychological and physical and mental responses to this performance anxiety that we have. What do you think they are? <laughs> Ideas? Thoughts? Things that come to mind. Everyone's afraid to answer. You, you know, so. Why is that? Yeah, what kind of things do we... we you can sweat. Oh my gosh, yeah, sweating profusely. Exactly. Voice cracks. Lose your voice. Mind blanks. What do I do now? I have no idea how to keep going. They're all looking at me and I'm, I'm falling apart here. Hands are shaking. They've got paper in their hands and their hands are going like this. And then what happens to the paper? It just magnifies the shaking, right? So we're like, well, yeah, you're giving us all the cues that you're nervous. So yeah, we see all that kind of stuff. Shaking knees. Some people get sick to their stomach. They can't, they can't go and be on stage beforehand. They have to go in the men's room or the ladies' room and take care of business and then come back. And they're just tor they're terrified. And this continues and continues. They're tortured. So these are the kinds of responses we get. They want to just run away. I've had people who have had to do a presentation and they will tell someone they have a doctor's appointment and leave when they're scheduled because they're so terrified to do it. And that's a pretty sad thing. We talked about the other stuff. You get dry mouth. You go really, really fast. I took a guy one time on my team. I worked in IT. I took him to a, a presentation on this software product. It was at a user conference. It was an hour and a half presentation about how we use this tool. And he was finished in 20 minutes. This was a problem because we were in a concurrent session for an hour and a half and he was done in 20 minutes. But rapid delivery took off. So now we know what it is. How do we deal with it? My solution is to video yourself a lot and watch it a lot. Here's a clue. Video recording yourself is scary enough. But if you don't go watch it afterwards, you have no idea what anybody else saw. Because you will tell yourself that you will convince yourself it was terrible or it was absolutely awesome. I guarantee once you look at it about five times, you'll be able to move past all the vanity and look at it and say, wow, you know, if I was in the audience, I would have found this even more compelling if they had done this. This was an area where this person got lost. You start to see it as somebody else, not just as you. So that's the one thing. Number two is to think positively. Again, we talked about before, negative self-speak Negative self-talk creates more anxiety. I believe we have two birds that sit on our shoulders. Positive bird, negative bird. Which one do we always listen to? Positive. Negative bird. The human reaction is to sit and listen to the negative bird and then confirm that it's right. Instead of listening to the positive bird, that they're both squawking just as loud. We tend to listen to the negative one. Spooky. Look at success. Visualize success. You're going to be successful at it. Number three is you want to be an educator. When you're sharing your story, when you're talking about whatever it is that you, that you do, your product, whatever it is, you've got to educate people about it. Not lecture people. Lecture is a data dump. If you think about it, if you went in school, in high school or in college, if you think about your favorite teacher for me, the favorite teacher was the one that gave me information. And when I went home after that class, I could use the information that I got. Versus a lecture, which was a graduate teaching assistant, came in, put the slide deck on, went through it for an hour and a half because there's a test on Friday, and then walked out of the room. And everybody feverishly took notes, and no one could use any of the tools. That's a lecture. Educate people about what it is you want them to walk away with. 
Give them examples. Teach them, not just a data dump. Finally, it's not about you. It's all about the audience. You got to start thinking about how you want the audience to feel at the end. And then how you want them to feel throughout the event. Not, how do I look? How do I feel? How am I doing? That's why you video record it and look at it later, and then you can identify how you did. But when you're at the event, it's all about being present, being aware of what everybody else is doing, and how you're educating them. Here's a recommendation for you. It's, called, it's a book called Never Good Enough. Highly recommend it to you if you think you might be a perfectionist. If you think you might be, read the book. I recommend it to lots of clients. When they read it, they come back and say, wow, I had no idea. She has lots of examples in the book about inwardly focused and outwardly focused perfectionism, how that perfectionism can get in your way, and ways for you to mitigate that, the impact of that. Other ways you can deal with performance anxiety, you can do re deep relaxation drills. Sometimes before you go on stage, you just sit there and, and, and just let yourself, it's kind of zenish, I guess, let yourself uh, go from your feet to your knees to your hips to your chest to your shoulders to your head. Just find some, some level of comfort walking through, these are all my body parts. I can, I'm, I'm present, I'm aware of what's going on, and I'm ready to share this with people. Instead of spending the time worrying, worry solves nothing. Reevaluate perfectionist schemas that you might have. I got to do it this way or else. And then finally, rehearse like you perform and perform like you rehearse. Rehearse like you perform, and perform like you rehearse. That means you want to run through your stuff before you go make it live. I'm going to show you a video real quick of a woman. Her name is Joanne Castle. She's on the Lawrence Welk Show. So it's probably from the mid-50s. Anybody aware of Joanne Castle? Some of us who are older know who Joanne Castle was. She was the ragtime piano player on the Lawrence Welk Show. There are a lot of things that get in her way in this performance that you're going to see. Here's what it is leading up to it. It's her birthday. She's turning 21. She's been on the show a few times as a guest. She's playing the ragtime piano. And Lawrence Welk comes out and offers her a full contract on the Lawrence Welk Show which was unheard of. If you were on the Lawrence Welk Show, you were set for 30 years, probably. It was a good gig. So here she is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this young lady is celebrating her 20th birthday. And we have a little gift for her here. <laughs> How do you like that, huh? <laughs> it's a surprise. Well, we wanted it to be a surprise. Well, we have we have another little we have another little surprise for you. Since the comments have been so very very good from our TV audience, we have decided to make you a permanent member of our of our group here. <laughs> We went through this to bring you a little happiness, not, not any tears oh, here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me ask you something. Are there too many tears, or could we could we show you the, the, the folks how you can play the accordion too? Oh yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you give us a little a little birthday gift too, and give oh. us a nice accordion oh. solo. Have Myron strap that accordion on you. <laughs> so she came to play the piano, not the accordion. Okay, this is probably not her accordion either. Because she didn't she bring it, she didn't think she was going to play. We'll let the boys share this with you. Myron, are you strapping the accordion on So they're on tying her? the accordion on her. <laughs> Myron? That's I think it's probably Myron Florin's accordion, who's the regular accordion player. Okay. And then watch how everything changes when she gets in the zone.
Okay, so what do you think? You can see when she gets out of her way, she's been offered these three distractions. She gets out of her way and she goes back to what she knows. She's rehearsed, she's a great accordion player, she's practiced, she's performing the way she rehearsed, and she probably rehearsed many times the way she would perform it. Okay, same thing applies to us. These kinds of speaking gigs, we need to pre prepare for them and then rehearse the way we're gonna perform because there's going to be a lot of things that get in our way. Lots of distractions, or you'll get a phone call, or something at work is happening. There's something that's going to get you confused and consumed, and you have to just be able to move past that. Okay? Next, audience engagement. What kind of things do you need to engage the audience? Three kinds of analysis you want to do. First one, demographic. What is demographic audience analysis? What kind of, audience. sorry? Speak to your audience. Yeah, what kind of people are going to be in the audience is the deal. Age. Ages, education, experience level. Gender. Gender. Culture. Culture. Nationality. Do they speak English as a first language? All those kinds of things would be important for you to do before you go to the event. Because then you can tailor your presentation, your performance, for them to get the most out of it. What are they really, what are they going to be, what's, what could possibly get in the way? Because if you bring in an approach that doesn't appeal to them, that could be a problem. Number two is the situational awareness, situational analysis. What is that? The room. How bright is the room? How dark is the room? How cold? How hot? Is there a jackhammer going on outside here? Are there all kinds of distractions that are beyond your control? Do you need a microphone or not? Will the people be able to respond? Is it close enough that you can ask them things? Or is it a room with 500 people in it and you can't talk to anybody? Are you wearing a microphone yourself? Is it a lavalier microphone that's tethered to something? Is it on a podium? Will you be able to leave the lectern and go talk to people? Or are you stuck behind this thing? All good stuff to know before you go. And for men, we usually wear things like this. For ladies, if you're, you have to know too, they're going to stick a lavalier microphone on me. I better wear something that allows that to happen. So for example, you have a turtleneck on. That would be tough to put a microphone on you with that, so you have to plan, ladies have to plan more than guys do, because women have more choices, and men don't usually have that many choices. So you gotta plan for that kind of stuff. That's part of situational analysis. Finally, psychological analysis. How do the people in the room feel about what you're gonna talk about? Are they eager to learn about your product or your service? Are they not eager to learn about it? of a client that was trying to build a new manufacturing plant in a town where that kind of plant had closed and they were trying to buy that space, that, that property and put a new plant there and there was community outrage and when they would go and talk to the people in the community about it they were angry. They were angry about this new plant because they had misconceptions about it. It was going to poison their fish. The cows were going to be sick. All kinds of things which were not true. But they already had a predisposed, they had a disposition, a predisposition for what they didn't like about it, what things could get in the way for them. So know that before you go into the event. Then you don't have to be worried about will they like me or not. <clears throat> this is a great tool. Monroe's motivated sequence is great for persuasive arguments. There are five steps to it. Step one is to gain people's attention. Go through an example of this at the, when we're done with these five steps and show you how it works. So you want to gain the audience's attention first. Number two, you want to identify the problem that you're there to solve. Number three, you want to propose a solution to them. Suggest a solution that, the, that would work. Number four, visualize success if they accept that, that solution, your recommended one. And then number five, which is the one we, but people never ever do, we tend to not do it as entrepreneurs as well. We're not really good at it until we learn how to do it. And what do you think that is? Call to action. 
Exactly, the call to action needs to happen. We don't ask for the sale. We don't get them to do something. We just tell them all the reasons they should, but then we never ask them for the business. So imagine that you have a blood bank problem and there's a shortage of blood in the blood bank at the hospital. So you decide this is a problem. You get a bunch of people in the room together. You show them a video of ambulances going to the hospital and maybe a family walks in and they have their kid who's hurt himself and he needs blood and they say, I'm sorry, you have to drive 50 miles to the next hospital because we're out of that kind of blood. Does that get people's attention? Yes, there's a problem. And then you identify the problem is shortage of blood in the blood bank. You say, solution, blood drive. If we do a blood drive, this will happen. We'll fill the blood bank back up again. And then you have to call them to action and say, and for your convenience, instead of asking them to go sign up for the blood drive, you brought sign up things. Please sign up tonight. The blood drive is on Saturday. Please reserve a spot today. Great. Call to action, done. If you don't do the call to action, though, you probably won't get any action. Other things that are important, eye contact, really, really, really important. Have I looked at each one of you in the eye today? At least once. Where do most people who do presentations like this look? Like this. And they talk to the screen. So using the tools appropriately is important. Which tool am I using to remind me where I am? Have I looked back, except for that time, have I looked back before? Only when I'm watching the video, because you're watching a video. Where else have I been looking? At the laptop, which has the slides on it. But we don't use the tool. We tend to look at the screen. And then we can't possibly make, I suggest, 95% eye contact with people. If you're looking at the screen, you can't do that. So it's engaging to look at people. This is not engaging. Smile. It's your visual handshake. We know if we want to talk to you or not based on whether you look like you're talkable to. If you're walking around with a frown on your face, and then I'm not interested in talking to you. You don't seem approachable. So think of your smile as your visual handshake. It also works outside of presentations. It also works at networking events when you go and talk to people, when you meet people, when you walk in the room. If somebody walks in the room like this, do you want to go talk to them? No. If they walk in the room with a smile and they look like they're here to talk to people, then you want to go talk to them. They look appealing. They look inviting. So you want to do that. What about two people that are both like that? Does that appeal to them? People who are? Stiff and so that person that I don't want to go up to, is that other person that's looking like that looking for that person? Could be. Could be. I like to go to people that are individuals at events who are standing by themselves because they're probably not talking to too many people. So I don't know. I don't know if people would go looking for, I don't know if people, maybe you're more comfortable in that, seat, in that scenario where you have two people who are extremely introverted and don't want to talk to anybody. They probably won't talk to each other either. They'll probably just stand there together and not talk to each other. So if you think about why you're there, why you're at the event, is that a successful strategy? I, I suggest it may not be as successful as you'd like it to be. Body language and gestures are important. Many people do this a lot. They put their hands in their pockets. They sit on the table. They do all kinds of things that say, that could tell somebody, I'm tired. I really don't want to be here. I'm not aware of what I do. I'm not present. I'm preoccupied. I'm consumed with something else. So it could be that. Better to use gestures that are appropriate. Do they enhance what you're saying? A clear and concise message. Many, many times people's messages are not clear. They're convoluted. They're mixed up. My, my tet thing is, does it pass the mom test? Would, mom under, would my mom understand what I was talking about if I explained it to her? If not, I need to redo my, my message. 
in many of corporate events that I have, have spoken at, the people that are in the room are not just the technical people. They're also the person who signs the check, who has no idea about the technology that's going on. Then there are other people who have some interest in it, and then there are the technicians that are really interested in it. So you've got to appeal to the broad audience if you want to really, really connect. Finally, I already talked about this, but do you want to educate and not lecture? That makes it sticky. That makes people want to remember stuff. <clears throat> Next one is to use active and committed language. I'm going to show you a slide which is examples of the things that people say that are not active. They're non-committal. And I know you've heard them before. My product sort of does this. My product kind of does this. How about this is what my product does. This is what my service offers. I want to thank Zach for the opportunity to come and speak with you today. I'm not going to, but I want to. I'd like to. How about after you tell people about your product or service, and then you say, I hope you found today's session interesting. Oh, it's a chance it wasn't interesting. Huh. How about positive, committed language? We hear this all the time. This non-committal stuff, we hear it a lot. Kind of, sort of, I want to, I hope, I wish. I would say this, but I'm not going to say that, but I would say this. We hear it a lot in our language. All right, next piece is how to, well, this is a, a Chip and Dan Heath. If you read their book, Made to Stick, okay? So what they suggest is that communication, um, the first problem with communication is getting people's attention. We need to do that in a great way. There are many ways to do that. I suggest that my name is, and I'm going to tell you about this, is not an effective attention getter. Yet we hear that all the time. What was my attention getter today? Video. The video of? Stutter. The guy who stuttered. Right? I didn't tell you who I was or anything else until you watched the video. It started that way. What other tools could we use? Questions. Questions. Actual or rhetorical questions? Actual. Actual. Well, both. Actual question. How many of you blah? Rhetorical question? What if this, what would you do? Do I really want an answer? No. I want you to think about it. How about a story or an, an, or an anecdote? My first day of college, I went into the big, the big hall, the big, uh, the big arena, and there were a thousand of us in there, and they said, look to your left and look to your right, and when you graduate in four years, one of those people won't be there. Well, that made me think about, I better do something so I'm not the victim that's not there. I could start with, a, with that, with a story. What about a quote? Could work as well. What about a statistic of some kind that's startling to people? I heard one one time by an infectious disease specialist. She got up and she said, we did a what if scenario here at the hospital system and we discovered that in the greater metropolitan area, if three people contracted smallpox, within 30 to 45 days, three million people would be dead. Then she repeated that. And there were a lot of people who got real concerned about that. Were they then interested in hearing about her what she was going to talk about, her story? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't want that to happen. That's a scary thing. So we have lots of tools at our disposal. I encourage you to use them and not Hello, my name is, and I'm going to talk to you about this. So attention getters, quotes, statistics, audiovisual clips, personal stories and anecdotes, they are far more compelling questions we already talked about. Some visual aid guidelines. They should enhance your performance. They are not the performance. You are the performance. The tools, the, video, the videos or visual tools that you use, they enhance what it is your message is, what you're talking about. Pictures versus and graphics versus text. Pictures are a whole lot better. I'm going to show you an example of that in a second. Slides should be clear and uncluttered. I employ a six by six rule. 
All the slides you've seen today follow that rule. What is the six by six rule? What do you think? No more than six bullet points. No more than six bullet points and no more than six words on a bullet point. The tendency is for people to write all kinds of text on the slide. And what happens when we do that? People read the slide. And then if they're reading the slide, what are they not doing? They're not listening to you. So you might as well say, let's all read together. And you can read the slide together. You can ask people to read aloud. Would you please read the slide for me? I'm just kidding. We don't want to do that. So you, you want to have something that can do a quick glance and then come back to you again. Flip charts and whiteboards are awesome tools. Use them. Sometimes you want audience participation. You can go and write things up on the flip chart. If you do that, make sure you've practiced your penmanship. Nothing worse than somebody that can't write on a flip chart using the flip chart. We look at that and go, wow, this is kind of spooky. Especially if you're trying to impress somebody. So maybe use the tool and practice that stuff. PowerPoint, Keynote, Prezi, those are all these kinds of tools. Did this in PowerPoint. Who's used, who has used Prezi before? That's a great tool. Anybody not familiar with Prezi? OK. We'll get to Prezi in a sec. I'll show you an example. But this is what we normally see. Here's the La Bella Ice Cream Shop's annual report. What do you think of that? It's death by PowerPoint. Exactly. So we might want to go for a chart. So this is better. The chart's a little bit better. It's a table. We can see that. We don't know what everything means, though. But that's better. How about this one? It even has a background that's ice cream cones. Because we're talking about the ice cream shop. Mind blown, right? Wow. We could do that. Yeah, pictures are way better. They give you the idea of what's going on right away. We don't have to read through a bunch of text. So this is a big error that I see a lot. Is you see the first, the first example a lot. I would love to see more of this. Prezi. Quick look at Prezi. I've seen Prezi used in, in pitches for big construction jobs. And they walk you through the whole construction job on the Prezi thing, and it's really, really, really cool. So it's basically a storyboard, for those of you who don't know what it is. It's a storyboard that moves around. There's a storyboard. And then you can zoom in on things. This has, you have to plan this out a lot more than you do with PowerPoint or Keynote, but it's a cool tool depending on, again, how do you want the audience to respond and react. If you want them to go, wow, that's really cool, then you might want to use a tool like this. You can zoom right in. Can include video. Okay, so you can put stick, embed videos, stick videos in there too. So it's a really, really neat tool. Encourage you to play with that if you want a bit. Oops. Okay. The final thing is effective Q&A sessions. And Q&A sessions, are, they often leave things in a bad way. So I have a little quiz for you. When conducting effective Q&A question and answer sessions, should you, or you should, identify how long the Q&A session is, that's A. B, quickly answer all the questions that are asked until the time runs out. C, acknowledge and reward audience members who ask questions by responding with statements like, I'm glad you asked that, and good question. And finally, A and C. What do you think? D, D. D A and C. Everybody agree with that? It's a trick question. I didn't like the first one. What's that? I didn't like the first one. Identify how much time you have. OK, that's the answer. I suggest that's the answer. The answer is because, is that because the other one of, I call it doggy treats. When you give people, we say, great question. Great question. And I don't give Abigail a question. I don't give her a good doggy treat. Then she gets mad. 
And then I start to have a whole other conversation about interpersonal conflict. Because she wonders why she didn't get a doggy treat and you did. Derek, right? Yeah, Derek got a doggy treat, but Abigail didn't get one. What? You don't want to play that game. The best thing to do is to just say, of the answers there, I have about 10 minutes for any questions that you have. If you say that, and then people ask questions and you just answer them, or repeat them if you need to, great. No one's getting any doggy treats. It's important, though, that you do say how much time that you have for questions. Because if somebody asks a question, and you're out of time, and you cut them off, then we have another whole problem. Because you didn't manage the expectations up front and say, I have 10 minutes. And then when you get to 10 minutes, you can say, I only have time for a 30 second question. We're right at the end of our time. I'm happy to stay afterwards and chat with more with you if you have more questions. But I can't do any more. <coughs> manage the expectations up front. Again, no doggy treats. Okay. So Q&A sessions, manage the expectations, especially the time. If you don't know, say so. I've seen a lot of people <laughs> construct answers that are not true because they don't want to say, I don't know. I don't know, I will get you an answer. Great. But not make up a story about something that's not true. Have a back pocket question. So when you open the floor for questions and you don't get any questions, does that mean the Q&A session's over? No. What's the easiest thing for you to say? Well, a typical question, I guess. Exactly. I often get a question about this. That gives the people who need some time to think of a question, a question for you some time to figure it out. If you do any Myers-Briggs type indicator things, extroverts find that more than three seconds of silence is deadly. And the introvert, as the extroverts, the introverts need at least seven to ten seconds <coughs> to put together what they're going to say and then say it. So if you're an extrovert having a Q&A session and you say, does anybody have any questions? One 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000. Great. It was great to be here. Thanks for coming. <laughs> and then the introverts who are, are just constructing are like, well, there you go. Happens every time. Never get to ask my question. So wait. If you, if you get to the five second point, no questions yet, then offer the one that you have in your back pocket. Question I often get. This one's tough for people. Seek clarification for what you're answering. Some people will go down a rabbit hole on something that wasn't asked even. They, they think they understand, but they go off on a different track. Not a good idea. Get in big trouble that way. <clears throat> have the final word. This is, this is tough for people. They believe that the last question is the end of the presentation. No. Save a couple of minutes, maybe it's a minute, for you to recap what you talked about. The reason for that is if the Q&A session yields some icky argument that happens in the middle of it, and that's the last thing everybody hears, what do they remember when they walk away? The icky thing that got brought up that nobody wanted to talk about. Instead, you have a chance to re-spin things. As simple as, today you learned about these five things. You learned the X and Y and Z, and people can then get off of the ugly thing that happened in the Q&A. It's a good idea anyway just to remind them of what you went over with them. And then always follow up. If you tell somebody that you'll get them an answer and you don't respond, I saw a thing in a high school auditorium that said, character is what people see when you think they're not looking. And if you promise somebody a follow-up, it tells them a whole lot about you if you don't follow up. If you do follow up, it tells them you can be trusted and that you do what you say. Do you want to do business with people who you can trust? Yes. So these are the kind of things that can get in the way of you being, of having your message be sticky so that it gets remembered and the things that you talk about get remembered. Okay? Questions that you have for me. Is this, what do you, what is, is it that you do with your Caraggio Consulting? Okay, Caraggio Consulting is a 
communications, communi communications and presentation firm. We, it's me. I help people to be able to communicate more effectively, whether it's presentations or job interviews or, or just how they interact with each other, with other people. <coughs> Telling their story is a big deal for people. They have a hard time doing that. How do you tell your story? How do you do that? How do you go to a networking event and make full use of the time you have? Do you follow up with people? So those kinds of things, helping people to really understand how they can communicate the best they possibly can. Does that answer the question? Okay. Anything else? Have a few minutes, five minutes. One question, yeah, another question in the back, yep. Um, I get very nervous when I uh, talk in front of people and uh, I know you said like try to sit down and relax. It's, what what it will be like the best thing to do like minutes before your presentation and you start feeling like a panic attack? If you start knowing what other people see, if you start to video record yourself and then watch it, you will not be ner as nervous and you'll get to the point where you're not nervous at all. You're just eager to share your story because you're confident about what other people see when you're there. What we're most often afraid of is we don't know what they think. What are they thinking about me? They may, and your mind can go crazy wondering that. But if you're used to performing, recording it, looking at it, evaluating it, doing that a lot, then you won't have that anxiety at the beginning before the presentation. So I think it goes long before you actually get up to do the gig. You got to start working on it now to say, I need to prepare myself for this because I'm going to get a lot of questions. And if I have a product that I'm trying to sell or a new idea, I need people to believe that I believe in my idea and not see the anxiety. Does that make sense? You know, it's, it's really not about flick the switch. It's about let me, con let me educate myself and, and prepare myself to be able to do this in a better way, where I'm not afraid. Cool? Got anything else? Thank you. For yes? One more. Uh, is there a book you recommend on this idea of executive presence? How to develop that? Is there anything you can particularly? There are studies. There's reports that you can find online that, that people have done about that stuff. Where, what is this? What is the it? Um, I don't know specifically of a book to tell you that. And a lot of things that I talk about are from my experience of, of being somebody that did event interviews for people for higher level positions. What was I looking for? You know, do they have that it? So, yep, thanks for the opera. Oh, yeah. Do you recommend memorizing your speech? Absolutely not. Okay. If you memorize, if you have statistics that you need to share, memorize them, absolutely. But if you don't have to memorize them, if you just know your stuff, you're, more, you're far more able to be present and available. If you memorize things, what are you going to worry about? The words that I might forget. It. Yeah, you start, to re, you start to recite, and then you forget. And that'll, wor that'll make you worry as well. It creates more anxiety. Yeah. I like this visual, uh, Gary. If it's in my head, then I'm going to have a really hard time speaking it. But if I do the work to get it out of my head and in my heart, then it just kind of flows freely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, great. Be passionate about it. It's your story. It's your story. When you're not encumbered by worrying about what people think, because you can be confident that they're going to think it's great, then you can speak from your heart. Then you can be authentic. You can be present. So then you would recommend just, I guess, memorizing your bullet points? Yes what you're going through? Know the content, mm. but not specifically the words you're going to use. Because you'll explain it six different ways. Depending on the reaction here, what are people thinking? What are they looking like? There's all kinds of communication going on here. There's all kinds, of, I'm watching all kinds of communication happen. I may be wrong about what I'm reading, but I'm watching lots of communication. It's impossible to not communicate. The only time you cannot communicate is when you're sleeping or in a coma. The rest of the time you're communicating. So you want to be able to be available to be able to read what's going on. What do I have to do? I got to change it up here. They seem to want more information about this thing. 
Let me ask a couple of questions. Are they willing to participate in what's going on? You have to change your, your, your plan constantly. And if you've got something memorized, harder to do that. Way harder to do that. Okay? Zach says we're finished. So. Thanks so much for the opportunity to come and share this with you today. If you have any questions for me, then please give me a buzz or send me an email. I'll put my contact stuff up here and I'll leave it up for the end of the rest of the afternoon or however long I'm here. And please reach out and, and contact me. I'm in Williamsburg. Have a studio there. I meet with people there. But thanks. <laughs>